All right, everyone, this is an episode that is incredibly overdue. We're going to be speaking with Annie Duke, a former world champion professional poker player and the author of the best-selling book, Thinking in Bets. She has a brand new book, How to Decide, which I believe was probably one that was from the groundswell request that she got from her community. Annie, you've blown up our entire worldview, our entire philosophy, but then we don't know what to do with that. Like how we realize that our decisions are crap and we need to do better. What does the decision-making framework, what does that actually look like? This book is the answer to that request, and I think it is an important one. It's an important one for so many reasons, and reasons that we're actually going to have the chance to explore in today's episode, titled by the same name, How to Decide. So to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I am doing quite well, and I have to say, I think this is the most nervous I've been before one of our podcast interviews in a very long time. And it's frankly because I've been watching Annie on TV since 2003 when the uh, poker madness blew up on ESPN. And most importantly, because this information is critical to our audience's ability to truly live better lives. And there's so much here. There's so much we could explore. If we had 10 hours with Annie, I think we could uh, very, very easily fill it. So with that, Annie, welcome to Choose Up Buy. Well, okay. So first of all, I, a couple of things I want to say. Number one, I can't believe you're nervous, but <laughs> <laughs> calm down. It's all good. Calm down, Brad. Um, calm down, dude. <laughs> but the second thing is, Jonathan, the the intuition that you have it had is like so dead on. So I've been asked a lot, like, why did you write this book? And the answer is exactly what you said. It was because of conversations that I had with my readers who had read Thinking in Bats. And the way that I kind of think about that book is that I was really trying to make the case for why uncertainty really needs to be front and center in the way that you're thinking about your life, the way your life turns out, your own decision-making, because it's got such a strong influence on everything that happens in your life. And if you don't embrace it, if you don't see it for what it is, that it's going to cause a lot of problems for you in the way that you're thinking about the world. And then obviously, you know, toward the end of thinking and bets, there's kind of a sprinkling of a little bit of how, a tiny bit of how, but it's mostly a why book. Um, And when I was talking to my readers, you know, I kept getting the same feedback, which is you convinced me. I now realize there's all sorts of ways in which I'm I'm backgrounding uncertainty and I should I should be shining a light on it more. And got it. But how like how. So what would a really good decision process look like? Like, how would I actually go and put that into my own life? Uh, And I realized that, like, I needed some more how and. As I was looking around the space, I realized that there's kind of a gap in the in this literature, you know, that, you know, I would say thinking fast and slow is like the centerpiece of this literature, which is such obviously an incredible book that everybody should read that's really outlining what the problems are in, in the way that the human ba- brain like processes the world and information and makes decisions. But there, there seemed to be a gap in terms of taking that work and saying, OK, this is this is what you're just. Dis- decisions would look like this is what would make them better and so I wanted to try to do a little something to fill that that gap in and to satisfy what my readers were saying to me which obviously was your intuition so you were dead on with that I mean I tell you you know I'm listening to your audiobook consistently as it's part of my workout process I was reading thinking in bets long before this newest book and the, and I'm what I just framed to you was basically my own inner all right I need to follow up in this conversation like what are you leaving me with here I got to I got to clearly I got to do better so Um, this is pretty cool, but I think for our audience, let's assume that there is still a single individual out there that has not read your incredible book, thinking in bets, you know, as a setup for this conversation, I would love for you to just introduce this idea of resulting and hindsight bias for our audience. And maybe we could tie this to something universal, although somewhat absent this year, uh, in the sphere of sports. There's an example that you leaned on pretty heavily and thinking in bets that I think would really be insightful for our audience to to think about. Yeah, absolutely. So 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 let me just say how to decide is is written for both people who've read thinking in bets and people who haven't, which turned out, by the way, not, to be not so easy. So I, I had to kind of like walk down a very narrow alley of not boring the people who'd read thinking in bets to death but also not confusing people who hadn't. So uh, hopefully it should reach out to both of those audiences. That was the intention. So I actually open this book for that reason in the same place that I opened Thinking in Bats, which is 
with resulting and then following with a deeper exploration of hindsight bias than thinking in bets got, because I think that it's so incredibly important to understand that the only way we can become better at making decisions is from our own experience. And our experience is going to be the outcomes of past decisions that we've made. And we need to understand the way in which knowing how something turned out can really mess with our ability to figure out why. So, you know, the first thing that you're talking about, which is resulting, is one of the main ways that this that this happens, that knowing the outcome really interferes with your ability to figure out, like, was that a good decision or a bad one? And um, so we can go back to poor Pete Carroll, uh, poor downtrodden (laughs) Pete Carroll, the coach of the Seahawks. So in in 2015, in in that Super Bowl, um, uh, played against the Patriots, there's an incredibly famous play that occurs right at the end. So there's 26 seconds left in the game, obviously not very many seconds to get anything done. Um, and it's second down. And the key here is that the Seahawks only have one timeout, which is really important because when you only have 26 seconds, this creates some big constraints on how many plays you're going to be able to get off. And it also constrains your play selection a little bit. So they're down by four and they're on the one yard line of the New England Patriots. So they can't kick a field goal, obviously, uh, in order to win the game. Uh, They're going to have to score a touchdown. They only have to move the ball one yard, but we know that that's actually a really hard thing to do, right? Because the, obviously the defense is like piled up on that line. Um, and it's uh, again, it's second down. So if there were no clock constraints, Pete Carroll would have three tries to get into this end zone, second, third, and, and fourth down. But we know there are clock constraints and he only has one timeout. So basically, I'm obviously not giving away anything away with this, Pete Carroll does something that's really, really unexpected. So everybody expects him to hand this ball off to Marshawn Lynch, who's this amazing running back, uh, clearly going to end up in the Hall of Fame. His nickname is The Beast. He'd been having a pretty good game. Uh, but he, de- but that's not what Pete Carroll calls. Pete Carroll actually calls a pass play. He has him pass the – Russell Wilson, who's the quarterback, pass it into the corner of the end zone, uh, where it's very famously intercepted by Malcolm Butler for the game-ending play. Now, when you listen to Chris Collingsworth, and you can see this video on YouTube, I actually open a lot of my talks with with this video. Um, You can listen to Chris Collingsworth call this play, and it's really just, I can't believe the call. This is so stupid. Why would he make this call? Blah, 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 blah. Um, But, you know, Chris Collingsworth is obviously calling it in-game, so he may not have time to actually look at, well, what really was the quality of that call? Because it it seems like it's hard to know what the quality of the call is if you don't know some things. Like, for example, how important do you think it would be to know what the rate of interception in that situation was? Yeah, I would want to know that. Pretty pretty darn important. The rate of fumbling, right? Right. uh... How about what is the probability of a touchdown if you pass the ball versus a touchdown if you hand it off to Marshawn Lynch? You might want to make that comparison. But there's there's just a whole bunch of stuff you'd want to know there. But uh, he's declaring sort of by fiat, this was obviously a terrible play. But again, like, again, he's calling it in game. The interesting thing actually to me is that the next day when you start to see the headlines, and these are, these obviously are people who've had a little time to think about the decision, that the opinions don't get any better. So what you'll, you see is like, basically most of the, most of the outlets are saying it's, in competition for the worst play call in Super Bowl history. And USA Today comes out with worst play call in NFL history, possibly. Um, Seems kind of extreme. And if you read those articles, they're also pretty math free. You're not seeing like, well, what are the chances of an interception? What are the chances of an incomplete pass? What are the chances uh, it's caught for a touchdown? What are the chances if you hand it off to Marshawn Lynch that he actually scores as an example? So these are things that you'd really want to know. But it just doesn't exist. And it takes about two seconds. And I'll do the thought experiment with you. So you're imagining these headlines, like worst play call in NFL history, worst play, you know, I think one one headline actually called Pete Carroll an idiot. I thought that was pretty special. Um, But you're imagining all these headlines. So let me do the thought experiment with you. So imagine that Pete Carroll has Russell Wilson throw this ball and it's caught for the game winning touchdown. What are the headlines the next day? Genius, unorthodox play call. Unorthodox is the word, but (laughs) winning strategy. Pete Carroll does it again. 
Yeah. Right? How about he out Belichick Belichick? Yeah. Oh, that one right there. Right. Oh. How about this is this the this, this you know, a bold call solidifies Pete Carroll's chances of getting into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Right. So this is the problem is that we know that the decision is a decision, regardless of how it turned out. Like intellectually, we know that. But what you can see is that that's not how people act. It worked out awful, right? Like end the game, interception. And so we actually do something called resulting in this particular case, which is we say, I know what the quality of the result is, terrible. So therefore, the quality of the decision must have been horrible as well. And then when I just did the thought experiment with you and I said, imagine that the ball was caught, well, we would know what the quality of that result was. That would be amazing. And so therefore, we would say that the, the play calling was amazing. But the problem is that that's just not the way that the world works, right? Like you can make an amazing call that has a very low percentage of working out and that low percentage is going to occur some percentage of whatever that low percentage is and vice versa. So we can think about the Pete Carroll call and we can see what the problem is. So I actually do know what the, the likelihood of an interception there was. Oh, please share with us. Yeah, it's less than 2%. Wow. So here's the situation. It's like very close to half the time the ball gets caught for a touchdown. Very close to half the time it's incomplete. Okay, that's fine. That's a non-event. And by the way, a clock stopper. Right. They got a free play, which is the critical aspect of this, right? right. Yeah. So 2% of the time you're going to see the interception. And here's the deal. 2% of the time is going to happen 2% of the time. I know that sounds really trivial, but it's non-trivial. Right. So someone says, but it happened. Right. And it's like, yes, because you will observe that 2% of the time. I don't know what to tell you. But here's the thing for people who understand options theory, right, is there's only 26 seconds left and you've got one time out and three downs. If you hand the ball off to Marshawn Lynch twice, like let's say that we're not going to argue that you would like to get it to Marshawn Lynch twice. If he fails to score on the first time, the clock continues to run, you burn your time out, and then you're only going to get one other play. But if you pass the ball on either first or second down, I don't really care which one you do it on. Um, in the case that it's incomplete, which is you know mostly how you're going to fail on that play, the clock stops immediately. So by passing on first or second down, you give your, yourself three options to get into the end zone as opposed to two. And the price that you're paying for that option is the interception rate, which is less than 2%. So once we do that, we can see, is it the worst play in Super Bowl hip history? Absolutely not. It actually feels like it was a pretty good play call. But, you know, it's certainly not in these extreme of, of genius or idiot anymore. We, we get to have a conversation about it. And this is the shadow that a result casts over your ability to see your own decision making is that it makes it so that you that it's like you think that the outcome tells you something really certain about what the quality of the decision was. And it tells you at least on one try, it tells you almost nothing. And Anna, you just said on one try. Right. And I think that's what's so difficult for people to understand is we're living one life. There is one scenario where this happens. So people don't really understand that, hey, this is going to fail 2% of the time. And I think that's where actually playing poker. And now I am the most amateur of amateur poker players, but I played enough to know that you see this in real life when you're playing hundreds or thousands of hands, right? Like you might have the best preflop hand of ace ace to do seven off and you're still going to lose what roughly one out of eight times somewhere in the vicinity of 12%. And I mean that like you actually see that happen and you realize like that doesn't change the decision that I made. And you see that when you have these multiple iterations, as opposed to just one life or just this one play call for Pete Carroll. So that you see luck come into this. Right. And I'd love to hear you talk through that. So I think the interesting thing about poker is that this idea that there's stuff you can control and stuff you can't control, it, it sits so front and center in poker. So, you know, as an example, if you think about that, you know, what happens after the flop, which is those first three community cards that come down when you play Hold'em, I've got two cards that I've laid my eyes on and I have three cards that 
I've laid my eyes on that are down in the front, right? So my my private cards to me, I've seen those two cards, and then the three that are that constitute the flop, I've seen. So I know five cards. That's what I've seen. But there's 52 cards in a deck. So what that means is that on the very next card, which is called the turn, the next card that gets dealt, there's 47 possibilities that could occur. So um, now that that obviously doesn't mean that I'm keeping 47 futures in my head separately because I can chunk them together. Like, you know, I can say, well, what if a club hits, for example, or what if a face card hits? So I can sort of get them into some groups. But even so, I'm handling like four or five groups at a time. And so there's two things that come from that. One is you really learn the future is uncertain. And two is that you figure out that 18% of the time is going to happen 18% of the time. You get pretty comfortable with that because you're sort of seeing you're you're living in this. There's all sorts of ways that the future could unfold. And there's some probability that those are going to unfold. And I recognize that because I'm seeing it in this very in-your-face way because I know that there's all these cards that I haven't seen. And then as those cards start to hit and as they unfold, um, you start to see sort of what happens over a large enough number. And what's what I think is important about that is that when I think about how do you learn from experience, it really requires that you kind of understand this stuff. Like, what am I supposed to think about the fact that this ball got intercepted? Does that mean it's a bad play? Because that's what we're doing with our lives all the time. What does it mean that the date was bad? Does that mean that I shouldn't go on dates or that I shouldn't pick people out of this category that I went on dates with? Or does it mean that I'm a bad date? Or, you know, all of those things, you know, I choose a job, it works out or it doesn't, or I choose a major and it works out or it doesn't, or I invest in a stock and it wins or it loses. Like, what am I supposed to be learning from that? And this sets up what I call in in this new book, the paradox of experience, which is that we know that we need all of those experiences to learn. We've got to see those, those things unfold in order to learn. But it's this one try problem that we have, which is that while experience is definitely necessary for learning any individual that we experience that we have can interfere with learning because we tend to take our lessons from from it not in the aggregate right not across a whole bunch of decisions that we've made in the category or even looking at what we'd call the reference class which is lots of decisions like it that other people have made which is how i figured out that the interception rate is less than 2% i looked across all of the plays that had occurred you know, over a certain period of time in the NFL. So I was looking for data to be able to figure that out. But we don't do that. We take the outcome and we draw our conclusions. And sometimes those conclusions are really bad, um, like in the case of the Pete Carroll um, case. So it sets up this paradox. I, I need these experiences to learn, but but unlike in poker where it's not so in my face, I actually tend to learn some pretty bad lessons from the experiences that I have. I'd love to set some context for our audience. We mentioned it in passing, but uh, you've had a an incredible career and part of your life as, as a former professional poker player. I believe just in your short bio, you've won more than $4 million playing poker. And and what I, I guess what I'm trying to communicate that that is a lot of hands. That is a lot of hands of poker to win $4 million. And probably that's a lot of hands that you won and lost. There's some combination uh, that got us there. And my point with that being in your book, you make this case that of all the games that are out there, poker has some surprising uh, similarities to just real life. And in fact, even terms that we have used and are using and are going to build on, you are really drawing from your experience playing poker specifically, and we'll talk about this, luck and decision making the outcome of your life being some combination of luck that 18% versus 82% and then the quality of your decisions uh and and I think that to me I hear a lot of terms out there a lot of people um especially in when we're talking about your success in life people kind of establish terms like privilege and where you started from but I've always those have never quite sat at the right place whereas what you're just what you're describing the quality of your decisions, which is what you have control over, and then luck, which is this indefinable, you have no control over it, that combination over time produces the outcome. And I'd love to just give it back to you, but have you kind of set the frame for our audience. Is that, is that, is that as close to accurate as we can comprehend from our perspective? Yeah, so there's something that really, like one of the aphorisms that like super, like it's so bothersome to me, it's one of my pet peeves, is people saying you make your own luck. Like, I don't even understand what that means. Like, definitionally, luck is something that you don't control. 
right? And we can think about it as luck. You, you're just thinking about like luck for me, the way that I think about luck is anything that is um, not within your control. So it would include, for example, the actions of Vladimir Putin, from my perspective, are a matter of luck to me because I don't have any control over how he acts, right? I have no influence over, over Putin. Um, you know, there's all sorts of like geopolitical things. I, I don't have a, the coronavirus as a matter of luck from my perspective um, because I couldn't control that it happened, right? Now, while there are matters of luck, we can control to some degree the quality of the decisions we make such that the options that we choose reduce the chances that luck has an influence that will turn out poorly for us. So let, let me explain what I mean. I could I could be weighing two options, right? And one option is gonna have a bad result 2% of the time. And another option is gonna have a bad result 20% of the time. Now, I'm ignoring payoffs here. I just wanna make this clear. I'm saying all things being equal, assuming that the payoffs to the bad and the good are the same, I would prefer to choose the thing that is gonna turn out poorly 2% of the time. That's the thing that I have control over. So I, I don't understand, like, I make my own luck. No, because luck is what determines, given an option that I've chosen, which, which outcome I'm going to observe on that particular time. What I do is I make my own decisions. So while coronavirus, the existence of coronavirus may be a matter of luck to me, I have different options about how I behave toward coronavirus. Do I wear a mask? Do I not wear a mask? How careful am I if I go into a grocery store? What kind of uh, am I doing indoor sports or outdoor sports, you know, so on and so forth. And I have some control over the likelihood that I'm going to actually contract the disease. So we need to really make that separation because the thing is that while we all are under the influence of luck, we are also very much under the influence of our own decisions. And that's why we should be so concentrated on our decision making in two ways. One is we want to see the luck clearly because you can't make a decision without seeing the luck clearly, which is a problem. A lot of us downplay or, or overplay the role, role of luck depending on the situation that we're in. So that's number one. But, but then what we want to do is say, over the course of our life, if we're making decisions where they're more likely to advance our goals than not, while it's true that any given decision that I make may turn out in a way that I don't like, by increasing the probability that it will work, advance me to my goals, those little advantages are going to accrue over time. And the likelihood that my life works out in a way that, that I enjoy is just going to be better, no matter what circumstances I'm, going to, uh, I'm born into. So it's, there are matters of luck that constrain the choices that I have. We have to acknowledge that. But that does not mean I have no choice. And you have to get focused on the choice stuff, because that's the stuff that you can actually control. Yeah, Annie, we've discussed that on the podcast here about the the aggregation of marginal gains. So basically looking for these little 1% improvements that over time compound into a better life. And we also think about that in terms of investing, right? Like what are the things that are going to help me over a 50 to 70 year investing timeline? are going to increase the odds of, of my success. I love how you just tied those two together because it's actually the perfect combination, Brad. We've got investing, which is very applicable for the vast majority of our audience. And then Annie just brought up COVID. And then we have people trying to figure out how to make decisions. And we're struggling with resulting in hindsight bias only three months in without knowing what's coming next. It's like, we're just, we're just bobbing and real. I mean, it perfect, like this is the perfect place to bring all of these different concepts together. Annie, why don't we go ahead and hand this right back to you? Like, how do we, how do we take those concepts that we just introduced and apply it to something that we're all living with right now? And we'll probably, when people are listening to this episode one year from now, two years from now, they're saying, oh yeah, that decision, Frank, that, that would have, that would have been, you know, you would have been happy with your decisions. Um, if you had this framework going into the next six months, the next year. Oh gosh, yeah. So that's that's such a great question. So so let me just first start off by saying that, you know, COVID has really kind of slapped us all in the face with uncertainty. Like in in normal times, um we actually really tend to think that things are much more certain than they are and things are much more stable than they are. So you have a whole bunch of cognitive biases that are really uh, kind of expressions of that, like status quo bias, which is just that as things are today, we we think they're going to persist they're more likely to persist that way 
uh, into the future than they actually are, right? But we know that's not true because we have, you know, I own a washing machine. So <laughs> obviously things proof. change. Yeah. Um, proof, proof. I have a washing machine in my house. Um, so, uh, but but that's status quo bias, right? And then we have things like illusion of control, which is exactly what it sounds like, that we think we have more control over the outcome, uh, you know, of our decisions than we actually do and so on and so forth. So there's, there's a whole bunch of uh, a set of cognitive biases that have to do with this idea that the world is a more certain place or a more deterministic place um, than it actually is. Now, uh, the way I think about COVID is that we're in this moment where uh, that illusion the ability to delude ourselves in that way that the world is really certain has been kind of torn away from us just because obviously things are really, really uncertain right now. We we can certainly feel very strongly the influence of luck, the fact that COVID jumped from a bat to a human and then uh, to lots and lots of humans, right? That's, that's very much uh, a matter of luck. Um, and then we can also really feel the effect of, of the other thing that's so incredibly important, which is uh, imperfect information. So we can feel that the information landscape is is changing really quickly and information, the things that we believe to be true of the world are actually the thing that we input into decisions, right? So that if you think about the two things that make a decision good, like if we go back to this idea of luck versus the quality of your decisions, what are the things that make for a high quality decision? Well, there's two things. One is the process that you're using. Right. How are you thinking about the decision, you know, identifying options, thinking about the way that those options might unfold, what the probability of those things are, so on and so forth. But that whole process is built on top of the this foundation. We can think about it as like your decision making house is sitting on this foundation, which is the things that you believe to be true of the world. So when we think about the things that we believe to be true of the world, we know that uh, if we think about the balance, like the things we know fit like on the head of a pin and the things we don't know are like the size of the universe. And then even in that little sliver of stuff that we know, there's a bunch of inaccuracies. So normally we delude ourselves into thinking we know more than we do and our, and our, our beliefs are much more accurate than they actually are in general. But COVID has come along and said, by the way, you don't know anything. It just sort of is telling us that in a way that we sort of can't ignore, like, because the information landscape is just like shifting so rapidly. So if you think about it in February, we were under the impression that there was no such thing as an asymptomatic COVID patient that could spread the disease, as an example. And obviously, that's a really important thing to know in terms of understanding how the disease is spread. And now we realize that that's not true. We're learning all sorts of stuff about kids. Like, I think even yesterday, they just found out that kids carry a lot, you know, kids who have COVID carry a lot of virus in their nasal passage. Okay, that was a new thing. I just found that out yesterday. Um, so. So we we know we can feel this, right? And the interesting thing that's happened with COVID is that I've had people come to me and talk to me about like, how would I think about making decisions in this environment that's so incredibly uncertain? Um, and when I start talking to them, they say, well, I need to know how to do this because I this is like, they think about it as a special circumstance. And then they'll say to me, is this gonna apply when the world goes back to being more stable? Which my answer to that is, I'm sorry, do you own stocks and bonds at the same time? Um, do you own more than one? If you if you like equities, do you own more than one equity at the same time? Like, do you have Google and Amazon in your in your portfolio? So I, I think it's so interesting that that's kind of my first thing about COVID is that people think that we're in a special case. But we're not, actually. Um we just can't hide from it. That's all that COVID did. It made it so that we sort of can't sort of turn our eyes away, like avert our gaze from the uncertainty. So one of the things that, about COVID that I think is really interesting is that it actually gives people an opportunity to think about how do you actually navigate the uncertainty in your decision making that will actually improve all the decisions you make when COVID goes away and the world goes back to being like, quote unquote, more stable, which is actually super not deterministic and really filled with luck and lots and lots of information that we don't know. So I actually think that in some ways, this is a big decision making opportunity. So then, you know, the question becomes like, how would you navigate it? Right. I, I love how you set that up because we're, we're clearly talking about all right now. I want to make better decisions going forward. COVID has showed me the world the way it really is. So now I'm going to I'm going to make better decisions going forward. But what, what does that look like? And I feel like the va vast majority of people, when they're trying to come up with a sophisticated way of looking at a decision, most of us just come up with a pro and con list. 
You know, we just draw that line down the middle and we say, oh, there's more pros than cons. <laughs> Has that been your experience as well? Oh, gosh, yeah. So, so look, you know, a pro and con list at least gets you thinking about pros and cons, which is a, a very small step in the right direction, but small. <laughs> so um, the problem with pros and cons lists, which actually a little bit unlocks the secret to, to how you might think about how to make better decisions during something like COVID um, the, there's a couple of problems with pros and cons lists. So I'll separate them into two categories. One is that it doesn't have any a pros and cons list has no dimension to it. So in other words, it's like you make a list and you put the line down the middle and you have a list of pros and a list of cons. And I guess that what you're doing is seeing if there's more cons than more pros, but it's quantitative. <laughs> yeah. That would mean that nobody would ever, uh, start up a business. Right. <laughs> like, much more on the con side, certainly, but right, this doesn't take into on, on starting up a business. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if we think about the startup world, that the pros and cons list would be really bad for that. Um, so, what I mean by like it's flat, it doesn't have any dimension, is it's missing two dimensions. What it, one is what's the magnitude of the pro or the con, the payoff? How how much is this going to advance you toward or away from your goal? Um, and we need to know what the magnitude is. Like, how much are you going to win or lose if this con? actually, you know, according to this con that's sitting on the list or the pro. But the other thing you really need to know, honestly, is what's the probability of that con anyway. So essentially, if I look at a pros and cons list, I can't derive any kind of expected value, right? I can't do like any kind of weighted average. I can't figure out what the balance of upside and downside potential is, which I can only do if I know what the probability of those things occurring um, are and uh, what the magnitude of the payoff is, right? I just, and I don't know those things from a pro and con list. So that's the first problem is it lacks those dimensions that you really need in order to make a great decision. The other problem with a pro and con list is that it's really a, a tool that would amplify whatever bias you have. So uh, for people who've read Thinking Flat, Fast and Slow, Kahneman talks about the inside and outside view in that book. And, and so uh, the inside view is that the world from your own inside your own perspective. And that's where all the cognitive bias is going to live. Like if I'm thinking about something like confirmation bias, I'm trying to confirm my beliefs, like not the beliefs of the world, but my own beliefs. Um, so that would be like inside view reasoning. If I think about um, something like overconfidence, it's, you know, I'm overconfident in, in my abilities. If I think about availability bias, the same thing, it's like things that are easier for me to recall, I'm going to judge as more frequent. So when we when we really go through a lot of the where the cognitive bias are sitting they're they're part of the inside view. It, what is also part of the inside view are my own models of the world. You know, so like, um, am I a value investor or a growth investor or, or a trend follower or you know, whatever. It's like I, I have these models of the world. They tend to be pretty strong. They tend to be uh, they tend to form part of my identity, the way that I think about myself as a person and the way my perspective of the world is actually going to be driven by my models of the world. So what I'm going to be doing when I'm reasoning about the world is that it's not that information is going to come along and I'm going to be, oh, I'm an objective person and I'm just going to analyze this information and then uh, I'll change my models if need be. It's actually the reverse. Our models create these co like cognitive trenches and then when new information comes in, we tend to mold that information to the model that we have as opposed to the other way around. So that's what inside view thinking is. And the, the antidote for the inside view, as Kahneman says, is to get to the outside view. So that would be what's true of the world in general. For example, base rates are really helpful. If I think that my business is going to uh, you know, be 90% to be successful when I started up, it would be helpful for me to go get base rates on the the probability that businesses in my space that start up actually succeed. And maybe I would change my mind that 90% is a reasonable probability. Um, so, you know, base rates, looking for the reference class, which we talked about, um, but also the perspectives of other people. I would like to get other people to sort of look at my situation and tell me sort of what they think about it. So that would be all in the outside view. So what, what is the a pros and cons list? It's just the tool of the inside view, right? There, I'm just making a list of like, well, things that I think are bad about something or things that I think are good about something with no dimensionality. And then here's the really bad thing about a pros and cons list is if, you know, when we enter a decision, we may think we haven't decided yet, but trust me, we've already started deciding. The minute that you start to face a decision, that decision, you know, what you'd like to actually, the conclusion to be, it's already started to form in your mind. So now you sit down thinking that you haven't already started with an opinion, which you already have. And I start to make a pros and cons list. 
And it's really easy to game because if I want to do something, I can just like create a lot of pros. I can write down a lot of pros. And if I don't want to do something, I just write down a lot of cons and there you go. I got to where I wanted to go. So I really try to push people away from pros and cons lists. I think they're actually a really poor decision tool that are going to amplify bias as opposed to discipline bias. And a good decision tool should be disciplining bias. And you've talked about a couple of things that seem to be fundamental about humans, right? You're saying we've already made the decision. You talk about these models of the world that are built around identity. How does one get away from that level of certainty and increase what they know? Like how, how do they get away from that line of thinking that clearly doesn't tie into what we're talking here. Yeah, so so there's a few ways we can do it. And actually, we can talk about it in relation to COVID um, to, to make it sort of clear how we might get to that. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is make sure that as much as possible, we're exposing ourselves to different perspectives and corrective information. So if you think about the, the foundation that that decision house is built on and, and you think about what the quality of that foundation is, uh, it's going to have two problems. One is there's going to be cracks in it. That, that's going to be the inaccuracies and in the things that you believe. And the other is that that foundation is pretty flimsy. It's not really broad because we just don't know a lot. And we can really feel that with COVID, right? Things that I believed a week ago, it turns out like I'm already finding out they're inaccurate. Um, and I know that I don't know a lot. So when we think about like that universe of stuff that I know versus the universe of stuff that I don't know, what I'd really like to be doing is sort of walking through that universe of stuff I don't know and colliding with both new information and corrective information. That's what I'd like to be doing. But we know that that's not what we do. We tend to walk through that universe to specifically collide with information that confirms our beliefs. That's why people who are really pro-Trump are not watching MSNBC. They're watching OAN or Fox News. And people who are really anti-Trump are not spending a lot of time on Fox News or OAN. They're spending all their time on MSNBC. Because that's where we're walking, we're walking, colliding with people and information sources and what whatnot that are going to essentially certify the beliefs that we already have, which does nothing to help our foundation. So what we want to do is actually interact with the world in a way that's going to increase the probability that we collide with different viewpoints. So that's the first thing that we need to do is fix the process of the way that we interact with the world to make sure that we are colliding with different perspectives. We can talk about that if you would like. Um, so, so that's kind of the first thing that we wanna do. The second thing that we wanna do, and this is actually really important with COVID, is figure out when is it okay to sort of say, I don't know very much, but I can decide in order to get information. In other words, to, to create this kind of like, uh, this, this, view of the world where you realize I don't know anything. And sometimes the thing I need to know is how the decision actually plays out. And so I'd like to be sort of cycling that through a lot in situations where I can be lowering the stakes in order to get the information that I need so that I can become a better decision maker. Now, the good thing about that is twofold. One is that you actually do start to create better feedback loops. But the other thing is, is it trains in you this mindset of, I'm not deciding because I'm right. I'm deciding because I want to find out some things that would help me make better decisions in the future. So it gets you out of this like yes or no, right or wrong, into this mindset of living in the middle of I'm not sure, I have some idea, and let me go test that out in this open-minded way so that I can actually improve my knowledge about the world in a way that's going to be useful. Because sometimes the knowledge you need is a time machine. Sometimes you need to get on the back end of the decision and see how that actually unfolded in order to actually make the decision that you, that, that you know, a better decision in the future. And so th uh, those two things, if we can, we, and we can talk about those separately, really train this mindset of, I don't know for sure. I know I'm willing to guess. I, I don't know for sure means I'm not willing to guess. Obviously, I know things about the world but I don't think that I'm sure of them. So Annie, you know, I think what a lot of us do when we're trying to establish, we're thinking about, well, me, let, let me do some introspection. Am I a good decision maker? And we actually look at maybe some of the decisions we made, like, oh, wow, I decided to invest in Tesla last year when it was floating around 400 and here it is up at 2000. I am a good investor. Or, you know, I got out at crypto in December right before it tanked and I must be a good decision maker. Like we kind of look at some of our decisions, maybe the good ones and maybe some of the bad ones. And we use that to say, 
I'm a great, I'm a great decision maker. And I, and I'm wondering what, what's the, like, what's the problem with stopping there? And what does like a framework, what would a more accurate framework look like going forward? Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so first of all, you need to understand that you have to look across all the, all the decisions that you make. So it may be that, you invested in Tesla and it ended up doing really well. And it may be that you invested in, um, or you got out of something that went down and that was a really good decision, but you have to look across all, you know, well, what did you go in that went down? What did you get into that went up? Because the results of one particular de investment decision, like buying Tesla when it's floating around 400 is not very telling. And in fact, that's the reason why we have portfolios. So, um, the point is that we don't know exactly which stock is going to go up and which one is going to go down. We want to sort of think about across all of the all of the things that we're investing in. Hopefully, we we have positive expected value across all of those things. And so, um, some of those are going to go up and some of those are going to go down. We don't know which. What we're really looking for is the value of the portfolio to go up. So it doesn't make any sense to pick one thing out of that portfolio and say, "Look what a good decision maker I am," because I predicted that that was going to go up. Because if that were true, my response to somebody who said that were, is that the only stock that you owned? Did you put 100% of your net worth into Tesla? Because if you did that, hey, weird, but, but I guess at least you put your money where your mouth is that you thought that Tesla was what was going to go up. Because actually, on if you think about it from that perspective, having anything but Tesla would have been a bad choice. But I assume that they had investments in other things besides Tesla, which means that they didn't know it was going to go up because if they knew that it was going to perform the way that it did, they would be timing the market perfectly and they would only ever have the equity that was going to go up the most in value over the time period that they were looking at. So as they're sitting there puffing their chest out about how brilliant they are, they, they own Tesla and that they're like the most brilliant investor ever, my question would be, oh, did you have your, all of your net worth in that? Or did you have a portfolio of stocks? And I assume some of them went down. Why did you own those if you're such a great investor? Which gets you to co go back to this idea of like, it's across to the point, um, you know, to the point that uh, Brad had brought up earlier, that it's not just a one try thing. It's across all of the decisions. So it's not that the Tesla thing is evidence that you're a good investor, right? It's, oh, how was your portfolio constructed? What was your risk tolerance? Is your portfolio constructed in a way to be uh, uh, anti-fragile or robust in the face of ups and downs in the market, right? How, those are the questions that I want to know. I don't want to know how Tesla did, because unless you had all of your money in it, shut up. <laughs> Right. There was a good outcome on Tesla, but there's so many things that we don't know in this uh, water cooler or cocktail party bragging story, right? Right. Because the, the thing is, it may have been a good decision to have your money in Tesla, depending on what the rest of your portfolio looked like. Like, I'm, I'm not saying that it was necessarily a bad investment, right? I want to know what was the process? What was the due diligence that you did on Tesla? What were the reasons that you put your money in it? And how was it sitting across all of the stocks or bonds or cash that you were holding or real estate or whatever your investment portfolio looks like, how is it looking in relation to all of those compared to what your stated goals were, compared to what your, against what your risk tolerance was. So I wanna know what did you do in terms of uh, thinking about the knowledge that you had as you made that decision and then how is that fitting in across all of the decisions that you were making in this space? Don't tell me that Tesla won so you're brilliant. That that makes that actually tells me that maybe you're not so brilliant, honestly. So Annie, we're trying to build a framework here of of how to make decisions, right? And how to make better decisions ultimately. So a couple of items you talk about in the book are backcasting and pre-mortems. So it's imagining yourself at some time in the future, whether it's a positive or negative decision. I'd love for you to talk through for the audience, like how somebody can actually use that in their real life. Like how first, what the concepts are and then how they would, how they would actually use this and utilize it moving forward. Yeah. So, so, you know, when we talk about the inside and outside view, what we're trying to do is get out of that trap of our own perspective. And obviously one of the ways that we can do that is to solicit other people's perspectives. 
um, which I talk about in the book about how to do that in a way that's actually going to get you sort of the best representation of what they really think. We, you know, we will, maybe we'll get to that or not. Um, but one of the things that you can do is actually to figure out how can I sort of get myself out of my own inside view and become, become that other perspective. And one of the ways to do that is that there, there's just a really big difference in thinking about yourself in the moment versus thinking about yourself in the past or, or, or the future. So, uh, you know, as an example, when, when I, I think I have this exercise in the book, I say like, can you write a list of things that you believed when you were 20 that now you're sort of like, oh, I believe that really strongly, but I've really changed my mind on that. And usually people can produce a pretty large list of those things. But if I ask people to produce a list of things that they believe really strongly today that are good candidates for revision in the future, uh, most people are like, mm. <laughs> no, everything I believe today is actually perfectly correct. <laughs> I figured correct. it out. I got it. We're good. <laughs> yeah, got it. Got the model of the world. But we can see that what's happening is that we're sort of seeing that 20-year-old version of ourselves a little bit more clearly than we can see ourselves today. So uh, we want to sort of get ourselves into the future because that helps us to look back on ourselves as if we're sort of looking back on our 20 year old self. And it allows us to see ourselves as if we were like talking to a friend and our friend was saying something that was patently silly. Like I'm a genius because I invested in Tesla and it won. Um, it's like, oh, I don't know. You might be a genius. You might be not. That's not a good data point for me. So uh, it allow you know, you can see yourself a little bit more objectively. That's kind of number one. Another uh, thing in terms of sort of getting to your own outside view that I think is really important is to realize that most of us live in imagining our own successes, right? We think we have more control over the way that things are going to turn out. We think we're more likely to succeed that generally than we are. Um, and that's sort of part of that inside view thinking. So if we can get outside of that way of thinking and start to think about, yes, I want to have positive goals. I'm not saying nobody should have positive goals, but actually it's much more helpful for me to think about the ways that I might fail, that that then gets you more into that outside view thinking, sort of, sort of being your own sort of outside observer saying, I know that my mind naturally goes to, I'm going to do great, but let me actually think about if, if I were a friend listening to myself, what would be going through my head in terms of the ways that I might fail. And I actually have a whole chapter in the book called The Power of Negative Thinking, which is really sort of advocating for this. So as part of that, sort of combining that idea of time travel with negative thinking, we get to something called a pre-mortem. And basically a pre-mortem, which was originally developed by Gary Klein, um, is a way to uh, take this idea of time travel and negative thinking, which is going to get you better to the outside view and turn it into a really good decision tool. So I invested in, a, I'm, I'm thinking about investing in a company. Let's imagine that I do. And six months from now or a year from now, the stock has lost half its value or, you know, whatever. You figure out what your own benchmark is, but the stock has gone down. It's gone in a way that is unhappy for me. Um, why, why do I think that that happened? So that's kind of the, the, the overarching thing that you're trying to do, but you can do this with like, uh, I take a job and imagine it's a year from now, I'm, I'm miserable. Why do I think that that might've happened? I hire a particular candidate into a position and you know it's a year from now and they've quit and they caused a lot of discord uh, on my team. You know Why do I think that happened? So on and so forth. So you can do this with really kind of any kind of goal. I, I have a goal that I wanna lose uh, you know, 10%, uh, 5% of my body fat, let's say over the next six months and it's the end of six months and I haven't actually leaned up at all. Why do I, what do I, what are the things that I think happened along the way? So then what I, so that's sort of the Gary Klein idea. And then I just take it a step further. And I say, what we really want to do is we're thinking about the reasons that we failed is to think about two different categories. This should sound familiar. What were the things that were within my control and what were the things that were really matters of luck, at least in, re, in relation to me, right? Like, it might be somebody else's skill, but it's it's somebody else's actions that I don't necessarily have control over. And you can divide those into two things. So coronavirus, obviously, as far as its existence, would go into the luck category. But you could imagine there'd be certain decisions that you made in regard to coronavirus that might go into the skill category. So you want to think about these two broad categories, luck and skill. And then on top of that, you want to think about um, what's the probability of and I, any of those things occurring and take some stab at understanding what the likelihood of that is. Now, if you really want to do a full process, 
you would do the premortem, but then you would do it alongside what's called a back cast, which is essentially the opposite. It's six months from now, and I achieve my goal of getting 5% leaner. It's six months from now, and the stock did well. It's a year from now, and the employee is like a total star. Again, same thing. Why did that happen? Uh, skill, luck with the probabilities, and then set those side by side to each other in what is called, I call a decision exploration table. Now, like from a fi this is going to sound very familiar to people in finance, but the really beautiful thing about this is that, you know, it allows you to actually reduce the impact of the bad things that you uncover when you do the premortem. So it's, you know, I liken it to the difference between a paper map and Waze, right? In a paper map, it's like you look and it's all clear roads. What Waze is doing is it's telling you there's a roadblock over here that you might want to avoid, or there's really slow traffic, so you might want to leave a little bit early. Or, you know, it allows you to, to sort of find success in the places that you might fail. You identify the obstacles. So if you think about something as simple as like putting a hedge on, well, in order to put a hedge on, you need to understand that the thing that you, the main thing that you're doing, the main investment you're making might fail. And we don't identify that enough. So by doing a premortem, you can see these points of failure that might occur. And then you can think, is there a hedge that I can put on? Do I want to change the decision? Maybe I don't want to make the decision at all now that I've actually gone through this process. Or maybe I just want to figure out how I'm going to react to it when this actually happens. So like I can foresee all sorts of different reasons why my portfolio might go down in value. What I really care about is how am I going to react to it? Am I going to try to sell the dip? Am I going to go around like changing my my um, the proportion of equities to bonds? Am I going to freak out and put all of my money in cash? No, I don't want to do any of those things, actually. And so I can make a commitment in advance now not to do those things, but I can only do it if I foresee the problem in advance. And that's what a premortem is trying to help you do. So Annie, we've talked a lot about how to think about this on your own, right? So we've talked about the inside view and then potentially using base rates uh, to help get an outside view, uh, premortem and backcasting. There's some things that you talk about in the book, like the happiness test, think about one year in the future, like just putting it outside of your current moment. So that's on your own. This helps me think about like red teaming, which I know the military does. And I think you talk about having these decision-making groups or pods. And I, I love for you to talk through how we can get groups of people, like how somebody, I read your book. I would love to find people like this. How do I even go about that? Yeah. So, so actually in how to decide what I kind of, what, what I talk about is how can you make it so that you you can still get the best opinions out of people without finding those people. So definitely go find people who really want, who are really interested in exploring, you know, caring what is true of the world as opposed to like, are you going to hurt my feelings because you disagree with me, which is the way that we, we interact with people in general. And if you can find people who are of a like mind, who are really interested in exploring things from different angles, I think that that's amazing. Go find them, cultivate them in your life, you are really lucky you can form a decision-making pod with those people, a truth-seeking pod, and that's amazing. But we collide with people on teams all the time who don't necessarily have those mindsets. So are we supposed to give up? You know, the, the answer is no, absolutely not. Because if you put the right frameworks in place in terms of the way that you're communicating with people who are on your team, then you can turn anybody into an amazing truth-seeking pod. And it starts with this really, really simple thing. Let's say that I'm asking your opinion about inv an investment that I'm considering. So Brad, if I'm if I'm trying to get feedback from you about an investment that I'm considering and uh, I ask your advice, what do you need to know from me? What information must I have conveyed to you to know that your opinion about the investment would disagree with mine? Well, you would have had to have already led me down to what your decision is going to be. That's right. right. I would have had to tell you my opinion. Yeah. So like, let's say that, um, I, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, a particular, a particular decision, uh, to invest in, in, a, you know, something. And, um, I want your opinion on, uh, what you think the probability is that it's going to go up versus what the probability is going to go down. I understand this is simple, but just, just, just let's make it simple. 
the only way that you can know you're disagreeing with me is if I tell you what I think the probability is it's going to go up. Beforehand. What I think the probability is going to go down. Now, here's the thing. When was the last time you had a conversation where you were seeking somebody's advice where you didn't give your opinion before you asked for theirs? <laughs> I've never done that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Five times. Right. Nobody does. Because you, I think that we all have the intuition that our own opinion is valuable data. But the problem is that that I'm trying to get your opinion on it. And it, and we know that human beings like to agree. We, we, we don't like disagreement very much. So if I tell you my opinion first, I've put you in a really bad spot. Because particularly if I'm someone who's, who's uh, you, you consider to be more of an expert than you are, or somebody who, like, for example, if I were telling you uh, how I played a poker hand, and then I asked you what you thought, it's very unlikely that you would disagree with me. Because you'd be like, well, she knows better than me. So a couple things could happen. One is you could suppress your opinion. The other is that your opinion might change while I'm talking. So that when I find out what you say you think, it's actually different than what you originally thought. When colliding with what your original opinion is, is what's actually helpful for me. And it's helpful for me in a couple ways. Number one, you might be right. So it would be good if I heard your opinion so that we could explore, maybe you're right. Number two is the truth might lie in the middle. That would be really good for me to know too. So I'm not reversing my opinion, but I get to moderate it. But number three, this is really interesting is I might be right. And talking to you about what I believe to be true, finding out that we're on different in different places in our opinion is helpful for me, even if I'm the one who has the truth. So let me explain why. Do you both believe the earth is round? I do. And if I yes. didn't, I wouldn't confess on this platform. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's say that I'm a flat earther. Do you think that you could offer me without Googling anything, really good arguments, not the scientists say so, or I've seen the pictures. Cause I assume if you say I've seen the pictures, you have to tell me why, you know, they're not doctors. Right? So do you think that you could offer me good, a good argument on why I should not believe that the earth is flat. That doesn't include those kind of punty kind of hmm. response. I mean, in all honesty, no. Well, hang There's on, no let me try. Let me try, Brad. <laughs> I'm just gonna go with I don't. Know. I could be as something about the horizon. I was gonna say but... something about night versus day. That was my best stab. Like, how could a flat Earth model account for night versus day? That's all I got. Yeah. Well, I guess the sun would go underneath. Oh, I, right. I don't know, but uh, yeah. yeah. So I don't know, but that's pretty. That's pretty bad. I mean, I'm, I bet, bet a flat earther would have a good response. To that. Someone the in our no. audience, I won't judge you if you want to send this answer over. I'll forward it to Annie privately. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it'll be informative exactly. for her next interview. <laughs> so, so here, right? So now we get to the heart of the matter, right? It's like we we all are very sure that the Earth is round, but I don't think any of us could offer particularly good arguments for it. So when I come up across somebody who's a flat earther, it's an opportunity for me to improve the quality of my knowledge. To first of all understand why is it that I believe the Earth is round in a way that's going to help me understand that as a truth better, but also. To, to butt up against the limits of my ability to explain my opinion, but I can only do that if I discover that you disagree with me. So when we talk and we offer our opinion first, what we're doing is actually forcing someone in to say, declare if you're in my tribe or out of my tribe, are you with me or are you against me? And either they're gonna suppress their opinion or they're gonna change their opinion, or if they do offer you uh, an opinion that's different than yours, it's gonna be in a lot of bubble wrap. Right, it's gonna be like, well, have you considered? Have you thought about? What I'd rather do is just just discover that you disagree with me, and the only way I can do that is to say, I'm thinking about making this investment. Here are the facts about the stock. This is what it's trading at. Here, you can see historically how it's doing. This is the market size. Here are other stocks in this space. Those are all matters of facts. So I give you the facts, and then I say, what do you think? Do you think that it's a good buy or not? That's it. Then, and it's really good if we really define the form of the feedback, right? Because then we can really under uncover that we disagree. Now that's great because now you can tell me your rationale for why, what you believe what you do without trying to convince me of your side. I just want to know why you think it. And I can tell you why I think it. And that's going to improve both of our knowledge and both of our models of the world. So for example, you can imagine you could do this with a pre-mortem. There's a, a candidate that I'm considering hiring and um, the, the question that we're both answering is what's the, you know, in a year, the candidates turned out poorly. Why do I think that happened? 
give your, you know, up to three reasons that have to do with skill, up to three re reasons that have to do with luck, what the probabilities are. And we can just fill those out separately. Don't, don't peek at each other's work. Now we bring that together and look at the breadth of what we're going to uncover, right? We're going to see where we agree, where we disagree. And instead of linger on the agreement, right? Oh, we both agree the earth is round. Um, we can linger on the disagreement. You think it's 80% that this, this person's not going to be with us in a year. And I think it's 45%. Why do we have this difference? What did you see that I didn't see? What did I see that you didn't see? Why, you know, maybe we saw the same thing and we're interpreting it differently. So this is a way to make it so that anybody that you come up against becomes part of a truth seeking pod. And then you can actually scale that onto teams in just the way I said, by having people do pre-work. Figure out what it, what are the what's the feedback, what are the opinions that you're trying to elicit on a scale of zero to five. What do you think the market opportunity is, right? Uh, Pre-mortem work. You can have forecasts. What's the probability that X will occur? So on and so forth. You figure out what that is that's going to be under discussion when you come together in an investment committee, for example, and you elicit that from everybody independently. And now somebody who's facilitating that conversation says, "Here are the areas of general disagreement." Yay us, let's not linger on that. Oh, this is really interesting. Brad and Jonathan, you're actually on opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to this particular forecast. Brad, can you explain why? Jonathan, can you explain why? The, this allows you to become a truth seeker without people knowing that that's what they're entering into. Well, Annie, I've, I've loved kind of the, this framework that you've laid out for us. And really it answers uh, to a large degree that kind of angst I felt as I was listening to the audiobook, thinking in bets, and you've kind of blown up all my pre preconceived notions about resulting hindsight bias, you know, my own bias to build my own echo chambers. Like it's all right there in front of me. It's so clear, but I'm like, well, what do I do with it? How do I do better? And I, you know, my, what was, I'm not sure, you know, or want to bet is now kind of, all right, here's kind of what I'm building. And, and I love your new book for this. I wanted to just kind of give you one last question here. And it goes to what we just kind of laid out kind of sounds like a process, right? I mean, it's not, it's not a boom, but it strikes me that while some things it's really worth going through this entire process, no matter how long it takes, like maybe something like an investor policy statement, maybe a framework like this we should go through this very long process and highlight all of these because the confidence that we could then put in that document will serve us for the rest of time. But I think conversely, and I'd love to give this back to you, not every decision needs to take three hours. Like the, you're not trying to sell someone that every decision they make, like life is a series of choices, a series of decisions. And maybe this framework actually in some ways allows us to make faster decisions. And I'm curious, like, if you agree with that and how we, how we would think about a decision-making framework with kind of the, when do we take our time and when can we speed things up? Yeah. So, well, I definitely agree with that because all of chapter seven is on that topic. <laughs> um, yeah. So no, it's good. So yeah. So, so essentially I actually think that mostly we should be making decisions faster than we do, but, but the reason why I build out like this whole decision process is that it's a skill in itself to understand, uh, first of all, which decisions require a lot of time and, and which you should actually be going faster on. And we, we often get that wrong. We'll go really fast on pretty big decisions, but then we'll spend 15 minutes trying to order off a menu, which is sort of the reverse of what you would want to do there. Um, that's kind of number one. And then number two, it's like someone actually gave me this really great analogy, which is when you get into a car the first time, you need to understand it's a slow process. It's very deliberative. You need to kind of understand all the things about operating a car and what the brake pedal are, is and what the gas pedal is and the emergency brake and how to shift gears and which lane you're supposed to be in. And I think, you know, but then once you get really good at it, you can go pretty fast. And I think about decision-making that way. You want to build out and really understand what a really robust, deliberative decision process would look like that would be really likely to produce higher quality decisions and then figure out, um, is this a situation where I can actually take a shortcut? And But then you understand why you're taking the shortcut, what it is, why it's allowed in this particular case, right? So, so all of chapter seven is actually about speeding up your decisions. And it's really about understanding two things. One is what's the impact of the decision and what is the optionality available to you? So in impact, th that has to do with the happiness test, which I think Brad referenced earlier, which is in a year, is this really going to have a, an effect up or down on me achieving my goals where happiness would be a good proxy for achieving your goals? So like when you're spending 
forever, you know, quizzing everybody who's sitting at the table with you when we used to go to restaurants and calling the wait staff over to say, which, which thing should I order? Imagine that you, you, you the chicken isn't any good. In a year, is it going to have affected your happiness at all? I think generally the answer to that would be no, which means that the decision is very low impact. So when the decision is low impact, we can go fast because the impact of maybe taking some shortcuts and not quite getting it exactly as right as we could if we take more time is going to be low. And that allows you to start to experiment with the world. So as you start to see these low impact decisions, you can start to build out models of preferences and what's good and what's bad and what do I like and what don't I like and what works and what doesn't so that when you come up against a high impact decision, your models of the world are actually going to be uh, more accurate and more robust for having made all of these smaller impact decisions, but speeding them up so that you can get more iterations. So that's on impact. The other thing that we can think about in terms of the type of decision we're facing is optionality. And optionality basically goes into kind of two categories. One is how easy is it if I find out I don't like the option that I've chosen to get back and go pick something else? In other words, how reversible is it? And we know this like from Jeff Bezos and, and uh, Richard Branson who talk about um, two-way door versus one-way door decisions or type one decisions and type two decisions, that the more reversible it is, the easier it is to quit, the less time we can make with the decision. So we can think about that in terms of like liquid versus illiquid investments. If it's going to be really hard for you to get off of that position, then you should probably be taking a lot more time than if, than if the position is highly liquid, right? So that would be like the optionality piece. And then also in optionality goes, can we do it in parallel? So that would be generally, first of all, portfolio theory that we can own lots and lots of stocks at the same time. And that mitigates, it, it basically reduces the impact of bad luck, right? Because um, if one stock happens to, we observe the 5% on one stock or the 20% on one stock, it, we, it'd be highly unlikely that we would do that across the whole portfolio. So when we're doing portfolio construction, we know we can get lots and lots of things going at once. We can go a little bit faster. And then the other thing is that the other way to exercise an option in parallel is to hedge. So the more hedgeable an investment is, that sort of the we can go a little bit faster on it. And that and we can think about our decisions as investments, right? So this is true whether you're ordering, trying to decide between the chicken and the fish or trying to decide about whether to go to Paris or Rome. Obviously, these are all in the before times, before coronavirus, whether you're trying to decide what to order in a restaurant or like if I want to have an outdoor wedding, right? Um, and I'm trying to think about if that's a decision what I want to make once I realize, well, I could actually rent a tent that I may not use, but I've got that as an option that I can exercise in parallel that acts as a hedge. Then it allows me to speed up my decision about whether I want to do it outside or not, because I actually get to do both at once, have an inside and an outdoor wedding at the exact same time, um, where I'm just going to choose one of those options if it's something that I can afford. So once we kind of understand these qualities, options and impact then we can start to go a lot faster on a lot of our decisions. Again, whether it has to do with investments or just ordering off a menu. All right, everyone. I know that this has been a valuable conversation for myself and for Brad, and I hope that it kind of gave you a framework for thinking through your decisions. This book will add value to your life and you should pick it up. It's now available anywhere books are sold, or you can go to chooseify.com slash decide for your copy. On top of that, I just wanted to give this back to you, Annie, because you co-founded what has increasingly become a national movement. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about what you're doing with our audience. Oh, thanks for, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. So I co-founded something called the Alliance for Decision Education. And the idea is basically if, if we think about the stuff that we're talking about today, this all goes into uh, what are the decision skills that you need? How, you know, how might you think about the world that can really have a really good impact on improving your life? And so at the Alliance for Decision Education, what we notice is that in K through 12 education, there's just a lack of decision education. Um, it's just not something that's taught. No, I don't know anybody who, when they were in K through 12, took a class that was about like, here's how you think about your decisions and here's how you might make a good one. I think it's just sort of assumed that like through, like if you read books and do analysis of them or something, you'll become a good decision maker. Or if you take trigonometry, which has nothing to do with decision making really. Um, that you'll that you'll become a good decision maker. So we're trying to bring, you know, obviously for people like you who have 
read all of this stuff in this space. We're trying to say, how can we take those ideas, uh, you know, from things that are in like Thinking Fast and Slow or in my book or in Michael Mobison's writings or Phil Tetlock or, uh, you know, Sunstein and Thaler or whatever, you know, like all these great things that are written in this space uh, and bring that into K through 12 education. So that's really what we're trying to do. Uh, and our idea is pretty simple. Better decisions lead to better lives and a better society. So, you know. I think the link is pretty clear there and that's what we're trying to do. So hopefully people will go check out the Alliance. Well, speaking of the link, if someone wants to follow up on this and get more information on what you're doing, where would you, where should they go? Yeah. So where they can go is Alliance for decision education.org. Perfect. And we will link that up in the show notes for today's episode. Annie, you've been unbelievably generous with your time. We've loved this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you so much. Wow, Brad. Uh, the book is an incredible value add to my life. I know it's a reference that'll be on the shelf. It's one that you're going to want to keep working through because there is such room for improvement. And again, if, if life is made of luck plus the quality of your decision-making, we don't have any control over luck. That's why it's luck. Good luck or bad luck, that's why it's luck. But if we can focus on that aggregation of marginal gains, if we can focus on that 1%, 1% better model and apply that to our decision-making, it's going to change your life. Right. Not yeah. maybe not immediately, but over time, it's going to change your life. Yeah, totally agreed. And both of Annie's books, frankly, right. Thinking in bets and how to decide. I mean, these books are going to positively impact your life. And the goal here is not that every decision is going to turn out well, right? Like you said, there's luck, there's incomplete information, life happens, but your goal is to make sure your entire decision-making process gets better. And then like we talk about here at choose of I, compounding takes over. It's that those 1% improvements that when you build them on top of each other, it turns into something remarkable. We see this with finance and we can see it with decision-making. So yeah, just a huge thank you to Annie. All right, my friends, if you got value from today's episode, go ahead and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. Just lets the provider know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. And if you're listening to this show for the first time and you know, you've been kind of, you have this idea, this whole idea of financial independence, this idea of reclaiming my life energy and getting some autonomy, mastery, purpose in my life. Uh, you want to get started on that path? Just go to choosethefy.com slash start. The fire is spreading, my friends. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.